The gospel passage that we have for today is often headed with this, Jesus walks on water. And that indicates that Jesus is doing something miraculous. However, what we really have here in Matthew is what is called a theophany, a revelation of who Jesus really is. And it's also a challenge to us as his disciples about whether we can trust and believe in that revelation. This is the second time in Matthew's gospel that Jesus is shown as having power over the water. In Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27, he's with the disciples in the boat. He calms the sea in the midst of a storm. Here, he shows himself to be like a God, calling to mind the many references in the Hebrew scriptures, particularly, for example, Psalm 77, which recall how Israel was led by God through the sea. And I quote, your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, through though, although your footprints were not seen. Or think of Job, chapter nine, verse eight. He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. And where God answers Job out of a storm, in Job chapter 38, verse 16, have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? As the late biblical uh, Jesuit scholar Dan Harrington points out, there is a rich heritage in the Hebrew scriptures for the idea of distress at sea and how God calms the rough waters. A particularly vivid one is in Psalm 107, verses 23 to 32. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of God, God's wondrous works in the deep. For God commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to God in their trouble and God delivered them from their distress. God made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had quiet and God brought them to their desired haven. As I was preparing this reflection, I was thinking particularly about this verse of the psalm in relation to young mothers who are struggling with infants or toddlers and how a cessation of crying or the luxury of the little one's nap time can create a haven of quiet. My next door neighbor just gave birth to a son and I hear him fussing a lot while she's walking him up and down the driveway that's outside my kitchen window. What a relief it seems, at least as I observe, when he finally falls to sleep and she can sit down and rest. I also recall my own mother who at one point in time had five children under the age of three. I'm the oldest of 11 and when I was 15 years old, my mother had triplets at that time, a 13 month old, and she had another baby after that. When she'd have a babysitter, often me or one of my brothers, she would go over to the cemetery not far from our house where there was a beautiful mausoleum that had a huge vault where one could sit in peace and quiet. It was cool and it was her haven. We kids used to laugh at this, Ma's over at the cemetery. Uh, but now I see it was her place of refuge from the often overwhelming duties of parenting and child care. So as this psalm points out, the storms that batter us about need not always take place in boats on the sea. Images of drowning and rescuing are also frequent in other psalms. For example, Psalm 69 has the speaker describing I have come into deep waters, 
and the flood sweeps over me. And then the speaker cries out, save me, O God, let the flood not sweep over me. Here in our passage from Matthew's gospel today, Jesus does exactly what God does. He stretches forth his hand and rescues the disciple who had only little faith. Matthew makes it most clear that in walking on the sea, this is what uh, Jesus is doing what God is doing, rescuing, rescuing those in danger of drowning. When he says to the disciples, take heart, it is I, or in Greek, ego emi, do not be afraid. This is literally saying, this saying I am, recalls God's revelation to Moses. It was the primary message for Matthew's community concerning the identity of Jesus. Jesus is the one who does what God does. To return to the passage itself, we see that Jesus, unlike the earlier passage in Matthew 8, is not in the boat. He made the disciples go to the other side of the lake. And remember last week, Jesus was uh, on the side of the lake feeding uh, the multitude. And he wanted to go up to the mountain to pray, to be alone. We're then told what about what's happening to the disciples in the boat. It's in the middle of the sea. Well, perhaps not literally in the middle. The Greek uses the word stadia, many stadia away from the land. Now a stadion was about 200 yards. Nevertheless, Matthew wants to emphasize that there's a wide separation between the disciples and Jesus, and that they are being battered by the waves. Harrington says this term battered is perhaps better translated as being harassed, which carries the connotation of torture or torment. The wind is against them. Our NRSV translation says that early in the morning is when Jesus comes walking toward them. Other translations are more specific and say that it was the fourth and last watch of the night, which would have been about between 3 and 6 a.m. This was the Roman designation for the final hours before dawn. Who has not been awakened at this hour of the night? Perhaps because of a bad dream or anxiety about things that we have to do, worries about our own health or that of a loved one. These are the storms of ordinary life. And sometimes they are so threatening that they literally disturb our sleep. When the disciples see Jesus walking on the sea, we feel a, a range of emotions, terror, fear. They think they are seeing a ghost. Interestingly, Matthew omits the phrase that Mark has in his similar account. Mark says he was about to pass them by. In Matthew, rather, after they cry out in fear, Jesus immediately speaks to them. Take heart, or literally take courage. It is I, do not be afraid. This injunction, do not be afraid, of course, recalls Isaiah chapter, 20, chapter 43, in which God says, do not be afraid, I am with you. What is new in this passage compared to the Mark and Parallel is the role of Peter. He faces down this ghost with what sounds like an impertinent challenge in the face of their predicament. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Perhaps this also strikes a familiar chord in each of us. It certainly does in me. Something like, okay, if this is really what you want me to do, or if this is really your will, show me, prove it, give me a sign. Jesus says simply, come. So Peter gets out of the boat and starts walking on the water, apparently without thinking and came toward Jesus. But, and here is his almost fatal mistake, he notices the wind. He becomes frightened and begins to sink. 
this too, I think, I believe really is something we can all relate to. Once we take our eyes off Jesus, once we become distracted, we become self-obsessed, unable to trust others, locked up in our own neediness, and sink into desolation. The only way out is to do exactly what Peter does, to cry out, Lord, save me. Without that cry, there is no salvation. There is no connection with God unless we can admit that we are in need. And then Jesus immediately reached out his right hand or reached out his hand and caught him. I don't know if Jesus was left or right-handed, but anyway, it's what came into my imagination. This reminded me, believe it or not, of trapeze artists. They have to learn to let go and to trust that their partners will indeed stretch out their hand and grasp it and grasp their own hand. Without letting go of the bar that they are hanging on to, they'll remain stuck in a position that ultimately will have destructive consequences. Sister Imelda Maurer, a Sister of Providence, has a blog called Sister of Providence. And she uses this image of trapeze artists to display how important the dynamic of letting go is in life. So this challenge of letting go is something that I see very prominent in today's gospel. And it's probably the one continual challenge of every person's life, no matter at what stage of life we find ourselves. Peter, of course, pardon me, Jesus then chides Peter and each of us, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Notice he doesn't say, you have no faith. He calls it little faith. It's not about being perfect or having no faith, but it's about our little faith. And don't we usually sort of kick ourselves in the pants when we realize when the wind ceases that we never should have doubted? Why did we ever doubt? This theophany concludes then with the disciples and Jesus together getting into the boat. The wind ceases and the disciples pay homage. The Greek word for that word homage is worship and it appears nine times in Matthew to indicate that they are confessing their faith in the identity of Jesus. Jesus does what God does. As I reflected on this gospel passage for this 19th Sunday in Ordinary Time, the evangelical hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, kept rolling around in my head. I believe that's because it's often used by the British Jesuits in their podcast, Pray As You Go, which I use frequently. As we look forward to this coming week in which we will celebrate the Feast of the Transfiguration, I thought it might be an appropriate preparation. Well, actually, we will have already celebrated the Feast of the Transfiguration by this Sunday, but we can look back at it in light of this song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of the earth will go strangely dim in light of his glory and grace. <laughs>